Good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome you all to the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American Culture and History. My name is Victor Simmons. I am the library director here. Um, I'll be short and sweet. Um, if this is your first time here, please like us on Facebook, Auburn Avenue Research Library. Um, follow us on Twitter, Auburn Ave Library. Um, if you have the opportunity to take any photos, please share them. Use the hashtag AARL, as well as um, Visible Man and Black Male Identity. So you can use all three hashtags. We'd love it. Um, please share it. Make all the people who aren't here envious, <laughs> or should I just say jealous, of you, you know, of you all being here for this wonderful program. Um, I want you all to enjoy yourselves. Um, if you have a moment after the program, Please take a, a look at the Solar Philanthropy exhibit. Um, today is the final day of it, of it being here. So if you're interested in African American philanthropy, it's a wonderful exhibit. And again, this is the last day. It'll be here before it leaves for South Carolina. So take that opportunity. Um, so now I would love to um, bring to the stage um, Georgia State Professor Scott Heath. Hello. I'm going to start here and then move over there in a second. Um, we had some big plans. I was going to talk about myself for like 10 or 15 minutes. I'm not really going to do that. Um, actually, what we decided to do, what Fahamu decided we're going to do is uh, <clears throat> do things a little more organically. And uh, you'll hear more about me as we go along. Um, I'm being very transparent here. We're going to be talking a bit about visibility. Uh, so. Uh, I actually had to download my own bio. Let me tell you about myself to begin. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm a professor in, in the Department of English at Georgia State. Uh, I teach and think about uh, African American literature, black popular culture, what I call speculative race theory. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll uh, hint at that a little bit. I'm really interested in the ways that newer technologies and our digital age is shifting and affecting the ways that we think about race and think about culture. Um, I think Fahamu's work does some of that as well, and um, that's where uh, his work and my work begin to intersect. I'm uh, <coughs> rapidly uh, completing a book uh, with Oxford University Press called Hip Hop, uh, I'm sorry, called Head Theory, Hip Hop Discourse and Black-Based Culture. Uh, should be out in the late, late spring, early summer. Um, I've written some things published in PMLA, African American Review, uh, Kalalu, a journal of African diaspora arts and letters, um, and a little bitty thing in the New York Times. Um, I'm working on a second monograph called Automatic Black that speaks to some of those concerns about race and technology. It's called Automatic Black Technologies of Race and Culture Design. Uh, and I'm interested in the ways that shifting representations of race, class, gender, and sexuality inform our contemporary constructions of blackness and Americanness, especially. Um, I do a lot of this, I have a lot of these conversations in the classroom at Georgia State. Uh, I teach classes like Octavia Butler Now, Reading Race, Gender, and Critical Futures. Um, probably more famously, a course called Kanye Versus Everybody. Uh, um, I expect we'll talk a little bit about Kanye West in a moment. Um, Kanye Versus Everybody, Black Poetry and Poetics from Hughes to Hip Hop. Um, and uh, for the second time, right now, I'm teaching a course called Chinese, Archiving the Love Jones Generation. Uh, let me stop about me for a moment and uh, very formally shift to uh, <laughs> Fahamu Peku's uh, biography. Uh, Fahamu, as many of you know, is an interdisciplinary artist and scholar whose work uh, combines observations on hip hop, fine art, and popular culture. His paintings, performance art, and academic work address concerns around contemporary representations of black masculinity and how these images impact both the reading and performance of black masculinity. And you begin to see some intersections again between the language of his work and the language of mine. Uh, Fahamu received his BFA at the Atlanta College of Art in 1997, his MA from Emory University in 2017, and he's currently a PhD candidate at Emory um, in their Institute of Liberal Arts. Uh, Fahamu maintains an active exhibition schedule. Again, as you probably know, <laughs> it's becoming more and more active, I think, as well as um, 
doing a series of public lectures, other speaking engagements at colleges and museums nationwide. Um, I could go through a little bit more, but I think I want to just hold back and let us ease into it for you. Um, and he's right off stage. Welcome for Hamu Peku. Yes, there we go. What's up, everybody? Okay, here we go. Hey, before we get started, can I do something real quick? You can do whatever you want. <laughs> I, I think it's a, like a really beautiful room, and some people are like hiding in the back, and that always makes me feel a little uncomfortable. So I'm going to ask, if you don't mind, for people who are sitting further back, if you'll just kind of come a little closer, you know, um, so that the energy is a little bit more condensed, and we can actually have a conversation. Thank you. I appreciate it. You can sit in the front if you like, yes, yeah. Just letting people get organized. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we're talking. Yeah, let's do it. Thank you for coming. Um, I have a first question, which is where is your entourage? This is, a serious, this is a serious question. Um, if you know Fahamu's work, you know that um, it's not unusual for him to show up to a specific site uh, with a, a retinue of gorgeous people, men and women trailing behind him, lighting cigars. Well, look, I, I'm going to say this. <laughs> uh, real, real talk, you know, some of those members of my entourage are in the audience, um, <laughs> you know, strategically placed uh, to, to <laughs> fill up the room. But no, real talk, um, I think, you know, over time in the, in the evolution of, of, uh, of my work and, and even just of my person, you know, my entourage has really been the ancestors, you know, like rolling with the ancestors wherever I go um, and having that presence be a part of not only who I am, but also what I'm saying. Okay. So you don't need to representative individuals anymore as, yeah. <laughs> as, you've, as you've come along. I mean, well, you know, it's about, you know, the, 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 the sense of, like, identity, you know what I mean? Like, in the beginning, it was really like a quest to discover, you know, who my identity, you know, what my identity was, you know what I mean? And, you know, tapping into that ancestral legacy and energy, you know what I mean? It, it, it affirms my own presence here now, so. Okay. Well, I always got a kick out of the entourage, but, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I asked that question, um, to uh, lead us toward another uh, later on. I, I, I think I think you're, I don't want to say a shul of the entourage, but the fact that you're, you, you, you no longer necessarily perform <coughs> in that manner as you introduce your work at, in, in different spaces uh, says something or suggests something about uh, a trajectory in your work. Um, and it's possibly a linear trajectory. Um, I think that, uh, uh, we can see that, and I don't know how many of you have had a chance to look at look at the, the book yet, but it's observable on a certain level. I am going to suggest later that that thing that seems linear is actually somewhat circular, in fact. Uh, but for now, we'll work on a straight line. <laughs> uh, I said we'd be visible, transparent. I uh, almost brought a pile of books, but I. Uh, took a picture with my iPhone instead. <laughs> I brought a quotation from a book called Invisible Man <coughs> by a man named Ralph Ellison. He wrote this in, or published this in 1952. Um, this is a paragraph that happens toward the very end of his novel. It goes like this. And now I realized that I couldn't return to Mary's or to any part of my old life. I could approach it only from the outside. And I had been as invisible to Mary as I had been to the Brotherhood. No, I couldn't return to Mary's, or to the campus, or to the Brotherhood, or home. I could only move ahead or stay here, underground. So I would stay here until I was chased out. Here, at least, I could try to think things, think, think things out in peace, or if not in peace, in quiet. I would take up residence underground. The end 
was in the beginning. Hmm. That's my favorite part. The end was in the beginning. Again, I'm hinting toward <laughs> a destruction of my own argument about linearity. Hmm. But um, your monograph is called Visible Man, and um, there is some, I, I assume, some obvious play toward, toward the title of Ellison's novel, Invisible Man. Can you tell us a little bit about that, how you came to that title? Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, uh, earlier in my work, it was uh, certainly a, a sort of um, uh, chase uh, to discover what it meant to be a black man. Um, and, you know, this was largely informed by, you know, becoming a father of a son, um, you know, back in, in 2008. And when my son was born, I was really kind of like, to be quite honest, like scared, like, oh, you know, what am I going to teach this dude? How am I going to, how am I going to raise him in this world to be, you know, a man, you know, with, with all the, the, the forces that are set against him, you know, from the onset because of the color of his skin, you know? Um, and thinking about the fact that I didn't grow up with my own father, you know, I couldn't pull from my, you know, my experiences from childhood to, you know, bring to bear with my own son. So, you know, this, this uh, quest was about me trying to discover what that meant. What, what does it actually mean to be a black man? Um, and, you know, a lot of the ways in which my own manhood was formed was through media images, through seeing, you know, uh, reflections of, of black men in, in, you know, television and hip hop music, you know, so I, I kind of shaped my own manhood from those examples, but I often questioned and uh, challenged those those ideas because they were often very stereotypical, right? Um, and, and, and they didn't really line up necessarily with who I was as a person. So a lot of what I was trying to do was to make myself visible in a, in a kind of a way. Um, and I wasn't quite sure what that looked like. So by the time I get to this, this volume, Visible Man, I, I think I've landed in a place where I really feel a little bit more at home you know, what, what that means, you know, and, and kind of like the, the quote that you just uh, <clears throat> I read from Ellison, like the, the end was the beginning, you know, uh, and so I, I kind of feel like I'm back to square one in, in a lot of respects with, as, as it pertains to my work, like kind of rediscovering myself from where I came from in the beginning. Um, and so this idea of visible man is, uh, you know, and, and if you look at the covers, actually the word invisible is in there. Right, um, but the the in is kind of ghosted out because it's still that kind of, you know, uh, struggle this this uh, quest for self discovery, but at the same time a uh, a statement and assert an assertion of who I am. Like I'm here, uh, and I'm visible, and I'm going to stay seen. And in a lot of the books, I often write, stay seen, stay seeing, you know, um, you know, to talk about this idea. Like in order to be seen, you have to see yourself first. Um, and so that's really where I'm at with this notion of visible man. It's about seeing yourself and then allowing others to see you. Okay. Um, another note on transparency. I have a ton of notes and just things I could ask Bahamu, you know, in just different directions we could go in. Do you want to go in some direction? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, we're going to go in some direction. Um, I've known Bahamu for more than a decade, personally and intellectually. Um, so I have seen some of these shifts. Um, happen again I just don't know if they're necessarily straight line shifts or if there's some more curves and zigzags um, thinking about visibility and 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 that that sentence from Ellison the end was in the beginning I see that in your work and in your experience because I'm thinking about earlier work of yours in which you are um, portraying um, yourself, and I'm going to say in parentheses, a, a black body um, on magazine covers, some magazines, some actual magazines you've heard of, some magazines you may not have heard of, um, on these covers, uh, beginning to experiment with uh, celebrity mm -hmm. and visibility. But the end is very much in the begin was very much in the beginning in the sense that, though I've known him for, you know, a decade, I feel a little nervous now, like I'm talking to an actual celebrity. <laughs> And maybe I am because now you are actually on magazine covers. <laughs> you know, um, your work is on magazine covers. Your work is on um, Empire. He had a painting on the TV show Empire. He didn't even know it. It's like, oh, really? It's, you know, 
right? People let you know that it was on their part, right? So, so does that affect you? Or what, what is that like? The fact that that the the, the thing that you were designing uh, uh, a decade and a half ago in your career, the thing that you were designing on canvas is actually <laughs> closer to home, closer to your reality. Yeah, it's it's kind of surreal because I didn't set out with that in mind necessarily when I began. You know, it was kind of like a joke. You know, uh, you know, for all the young ears in the room, you know, forgive me, but you know, I started out with this marketing campaign called Fahamu Peku is the shit. And the whole idea was like really rooted in this this uh frustration from the fact that, you know, I was trying to get my career off the ground as an artist. I was sending packages to galleries and institutions and nobody was calling me back. So I was kinda like, well, you know, maybe they're not calling me back because they can't pronounce my name. So I'm going to do something to make sure that when they see my name, they're like, oh, this is that guy. You know, so I started this whole Fahamu Pekus the shit, you know, campaign. It was a guerrilla marketing campaign um, where I would put stickers and posters all over town. Uh, and it didn't say what I did. It didn't say who I was or anything. It just it literally just said, the, you know, the, the phrase. And it had a picture of me with no shirt on, you know, looking as hard as I could, you know. Um, but it was like, it was almost like an instant hit, you know, like people immediately began to react to it. Um, and, and, and I designed it in a way to, you know, appeal to a certain kind of uh, response, you know, with, with respect to like uh, the hip hop generation. And so it was really interesting, you know, to in, in many ways kind of fumble and, and trip into, you know, the discoveries that I made because I, they weren't necessarily like deliberate. I didn't start out saying, I'm going to explore and investigate you know, the state of black masculinity. I was just like, I never see black men, especially of a hip hop generation and hip with a hip hop body on the covers of fine art magazines. So I'm gonna put myself on the covers of fine art magazines, you know, throwing up my middle finger and, you know, with a bunch of references to hip hop culture. You know, I just wanted to see what would happen. You know, but over time it taught me, you know, uh, or I, I began to learn about you know, what, uh, uh, learn about representation um, and how representation both informed and influenced. Yeah. Okay, let's dig. Why do you always have your shirt off? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wait, in, on, on canvas? Yeah, yeah. And in real life? I mean, um, you know, before becoming internationally famous, Fahamu was, was uh, pretty well known in Atlanta, yeah. for sure. And you, and you, For not wearing a shirt. And, and you've run well, <laughs> maybe. But you've—I mean, you've—you've uh, you've orchestrated any number of projects, including. Um, I'm thinking about witnessing a couple of times your um, Yo Karaoke, mm -hmm. um, which is a karaoke series that focused on hip hop and R&B, especially, right? Mm -hmm. And typically, well, it was, it was any genre of music. It, oh. it, it was just black people singing karaoke. That was oh, okay, so any genre of music. <laughs> but one constant is that Fahamu's near the DJ on the mic, no shirt. Orisha B's out, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, why shirtless? Well, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of this is like, to be quite honest, I don't know why I can't keep a shirt on. It just, <laughs> I, it, it's fun to me, and maybe it's funny. Uh, but it, it, the, the shirtless thing really started way, way back in the day when I used to host um, an open mic poetry night called um, Elevation uh -huh. at Yin Yang Cafe. Um, shout out to all my Yin Yang heads in the building. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, Back then, I used to host under the, my MC name was Sexual Chocolate, Sex Choc if you nasty. Um, now we get, we're getting to it. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> okay. And, 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 you know, halfway through the, the poetry night, you know, the shirt was off. Because, you know, I, I wasn't a poet, you know what I mean? So, like, all of the other open mic events, you know, the hosts were also poets. And they would get up there, and a poet would come up and, and do a really dope piece. And then the host would feel somewhat, you know, like competitive and then he would have to come and instead of hosting the show he's like trying to do his own thing to, to win the crowd back and I always found that like hilarious mm -hmm. you know uh, and so me I was all more, in the videos yeah yeah, yeah right. <laughs> right. <laughs> me I was like I was more jokey with it you know what I'm saying right. so like I was hosting that you know somebody would come up and do like a really really heavy poem and it'd be really beautiful but it'd be really heavy you know and I would come up and I would do something you know to bring levity to the room, you know what I'm saying? Like to kind of bridge the gap between that piece and the next piece and, you know, so the shirt coming off thing was just kind of part of my shtick, you know? Yeah. Uh, but now it, it really is about an expression of the body 
Um, you know, and, uh, you know, often appear shirtless in my work, um, you know, one, to talk about, you know, the skin, you know, to show skin, <coughs> excuse me, um, but also, you know, to, uh, to draw attention to the fact that, especially um, in popular media, uh, you know, a, a shirtless black male is, is something that still brings up a lot of, like, uh, you know, this discomfort for Absolutely. a lot of people. Absolutely. Um, and I'm, you know, uh, sort of speaking to uh, the beauty in that body, the poetry, the majesty. Uh, and, and, you know, and also just, you know, our skin is beautiful skin and it's beautiful in paint. So, yeah. I was hoping you would say that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the advertisement, the flyer for my course, the Black 90s, features uh, D'Angelo, um, 1990s D'Angelo. <laughs> Neo soul singer for the younger people, um, uh, shirtless, <laughs> as he often appeared. And around '99, he appeared shirtless and with with Orisha Bees, yeah. you know, um, pretty pretty often. Um, I'm glad you said that for a few reasons because you touch on a few points um, I want us to hit on. One, um, you were hosting poetry nights, um, which uh, to me speaks back to what I read in some of your work, which is. Um, obviously an interesting visual, but, but an interesting written text as well, and how that works with the visual, whether it be embedded or um, uh, hidden mm -hmm. in it, truly hidden, embedded or truly hidden um, as paratext. And we'll talk about that. Um, uh, I think that the, the shirtlessness um, you know, you said you sometimes appear shirtless, and <laughs> some some of it he usually appears shirtless <laughs> uh, in his uh, in his in his work. And I do think that 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 says something about body, in particular, like actually showing showing the body, showing the the flesh. And it makes me think of uh, what would have been a subtitle for this gathering: um, the art of remembering the black body. Um, that subtitle seems to have been cut. I, I play with it. I play with it. What's the subtitle now? Uh, I, I mean, it's still remembering the black body, but sometimes, oh, okay. it's, <laughs> sometimes it's remembering the black male body. But then, you know, I'm, I'm speaking more broadly, so you know. Uh, it's, re, it's, it's, it's re it's re hyphen member by yeah, the way, so not just remember, but remembering is right. the most important part. Reassembling, maybe, right? Possibly, exactly. yeah. Right. Recomposing, mm -hmm. yeah. So is that is that the thrust of this? Well, I don't want to call this a collection because it's such a, you know, such a, a, a long span of work. I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a, I don't want to call it a retrospective either. <laughs> but, but, but does that, does that idea centralize the work in Invisible Man? Well, I would say um, uh, remembering, uh, you know, is a, is a, is a, is a, a theme that underscores uh, at least the last three to four years of my work. Um, and so Invisible Men, it's a little bit more of a, a broader art, um, art uh, that, that looks back at those earlier works and then sort of uh, examines, you know, the, the kind of shifting uh, landscape in the work uh, over the course of about 15 to 16 years. All right, so is there, is there a suggestion that the body has been previously dismembered? Almost certainly. Okay. Um, and, when, and, and I should say this too, when I talk about body, I'm not just talking about the physical body, but bodies as, uh, as bodies of knowledge, mm -hmm. you know, bodies of, of, of language, you know, bodies of understanding. So when we talk about the black body in that, that sense, the black body is, is certainly um, in, in, in ways that are countless, uh, has been dismembered and, and disconnected and uh, dissociated uh, from itself. So when we talk about language, you know, we, we don't speak, you know, a, a indigenous African tongue here. You know what I mean? We're, we're speaking other people's languages. We're speaking other people's ideas. We're, you know what I mean? So, like, uh, what, I'm, what I'm interested in is reassessing, you know, blackness and how do we reaffirm, reconfirm, realign ourselves to our core, to our essence, um, over and above the ways in which we have been conditioned. Uh, in this society to think about ourselves. So re remembering is, yeah, it's, it's certainly about this fractured, fragmented black body that we're trying to assess and put together to be whole again. Okay. Um, you're doing this thing again, which is a, a suggestion about a 
linear trajectory, um, Africanness. Mm -hmm. One of the things I see in your work from certainly from 05 to the present is an increased attention to or investment in uh, Africanist ideas, mm -hmm. negritude, uh, pan-Africanist ideas, mm -hmm. I should probably say, and diaspora. Mm -hmm. um, is the emergence of, of that sort of theme um, very deliberate, or have I been missing something all along? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not anything new. Um, and in fact, I would argue, uh, you know, even long before I was doing the Fahamu Peku was a shit type work, you know, my work was invested in an understanding and exploration of my Africanness um, as a way of grounding myself, of discovering, you know, of, of, of finding who it is that I am. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's this is really, I, as, as we kind of go back and forth about this notion of linearity, right? Like, there's this really great uh, book that I've, I've been forcing myself through um, uh, by Margot Natalie Crawford, um, uh, Black Post-Blackness. Uh, and, and in it, she describes the idea of blackness. It's not, it's not a linear kind of thing. You know, like, our expressions of blackness are you know, a, a great way for me to describe it is like hip hop music, right? So hip hop music is not just people rapping, you know, over some beats. Like it's you know pulling from you know jazz music and pulling from Latin music and pulling from Caribbean music, and you're you're, you're sourcing all of these uh, different spaces uh, to construct this identity uh, of blackness, this identity of hip hop, um, and in that way you're like moving not ac not only across uh, physical space, but you're also moving across time, right? And our our our, our black identity um, and the way in we the ways in which we express it also operate in a similar kind of way. Um, you know, even you know to begin this talk, you go back to 1950, uh, 52 to Ralph Ellison. You know what I'm saying? To to introduce this conversation, right? So we're constantly pulling from various errors of blackness in the construction of our present day and potentially future blackness. Sort of an archive yeah. that you draw from. It's an archive that you draw from, but you also create simultaneously. So it, like, like time almost doesn't exist, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, you know, it's, it's what, what's relevant. You know, it's only what's relevant. Here's the thing. A lot of I mean, I agree, um, but a lot of what I see, and maybe other viewers see uh, in your earlier work, is um, uh, along with along with the the, the the references to potential celebrity, um, a lot of concerns I think with containment and and um, um, constriction. You know, a lot of uh, figure figurative work that 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 shows individuals trapped in boxes mm -hmm. and against walls and, and that sort of thing. Um, how, do, how, do, how do I reconcile that with this notion of blackness as a, as a sort of movable, movable, transformable um, notion? Yeah, well, I mean, again, you know, the, the, as, as much as the work is about a sort of collective idea of blackness or black masculinity, it's also reflective of sort of um, autobiographical journey, you know? Um, so the questions that I am wrestling with make their way into my work. Um, and as they become resolved, you know, they evolve into something else. Um, so, you know, the, the work that you're referring to uh, specifically is a part of a series called I Know Why the Caged Bird Blings. Um, and, you know, of course, the, you know, the title pulls from Maya Angelou's uh, I know why the cage bird sings, but it talks about this notion of, of, of uh, you know, the, the attraction within uh, black culture, and specifically within hip hop culture, to be fl flossy, to shine, to, to, you know, to bling, um, as a almost um, like like uh, essential, necessary. Uh, you know, um, expression that, that's, that's innate. It's, you know, it's not, not even something that you consciously decide to do. It's just a part of how you do. Um, and, uh, you know, in that, you know, I was, you know, 
uh, trying to, to, to address both the need to bling, but also the kinds of uh, confinements and restrictions that happen that get affixed to that body when it does that, right? So we, we're, as much as um, uh, looking to, uh, to expose and to undo stereotypes, I'm also, you know, keenly aware that they exist um, and that those types of readings exist and those types of readings, uh, stereotypical readings, continue to impact you know, the way black bodies are able to move in the world. Not just are able to move in the sense of someone else's control, but are able to move in the sense of how they see themselves and what they're capable of doing. Um, and so, you know, in order to address those things, rather than, uh, you know, uh, try to like, you know, beat people over the head with this, oh, that's wrong, you shouldn't do that kind of thing. Like, I, I actually try to get into those stereotypes, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, it's like Stuart Hall talks about, you know, in order to like undo stereotypes, you gotta, you gotta get inside of them and explode them from the inside out, right? And so like by perform performing these stereotypes, it allows uh, not only me to work through them, but it also allows the viewer to see that there's something a little bit off about this. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm approaching this and I think I know what this is, but by the time I get to it and I look at it and I begin to engage with it and interact with it, I'm realizing that something else is, is happening here. Um, and so, the st you know, like by performing the stereotypes, I actually get to expose the fallacy of the stereotypes at the same time. So, it's, you know, it's, it's about, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's a, um, you know, like a fine line, you know, between, uh, um, you know, undoing the stereotype, but also becoming the stereotype. Okay. Uh, let's talk about hip hop in, uh, in two sections. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to try to remember the second one as I talk about the first one. Here's the first one. Um, in my work in, in, in head theory, um, I talk about hip hop as a um, hip hop as we've known it, or as we talk about it, as sort of a broken model, um, especially hip hop up 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 and through the 1990s. Some of the things that we would hold on to, like this idea of a hip hop nation, you know, this one consolidated sort of community. I think it, I think is being being exploded in certain ways. I, I, th I think there are many hip hop nations, many hip hop communities at this point. You know that may or may not even interact. Um, we were very much concerned with keeping it real, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think our, our our notion of the real has been exploded in so many different ways. You know, uh, 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 ideas about authenticity have been exploded in so many different ways. Um, we've gotten to a point where I think we, we, we should have realized by now that, that that everything that someone says on a rap in a rap song is not necessarily what that person does in real life. Right? And we have more and more artists who, who admit that up front, who, who say of course not, you know. Which is interesting because they're they're also finally finally saying this isn't just reportage, this is art. Right? There is there is room for metaphor. Right. Um, I think uh, some some of your some of your early work earlier work um, I think when it's not poking fun, it has a very serious tone about hip hop and and what I say are its, its excesses, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, some of the Gravity series, uh, uh, the the sweet before that, uh, all that glitters ain't gold. All that glitters ain't gold with with the with the boxer shorts, the many many boxer oh shorts. Oh yeah, it's Gravity. Right. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it seems like you're speaking speaking to to these stereotypes mm -hmm. in a sense, or these, these ideas of what, what masculinity is, what blackness is, and especially in a, in a, in a hip hop inflected context. Um, and in doing so, almost poking fun at the celebrity, mm -hmm. the explosive celebrity that you seem to have aspired to early on, very early on. Um, so another notion that I think has exploded a little bit since the 90s especially is the idea of an underground you know and a lot of things have changed it used to be an underground artist was one who didn't have a record deal mm -hmm. you know now I think <sighs> right you you if, if you're not putting it out without a record deal then you're like <laughs> yeah I, th I think Chance the Rapper just went right, Randy, yeah, right? Yeah. with no with no label right <laughs> um, almost poking fun at people who had labels right. like see you know I'm free mm hmm did he did someone say he signed now oh Oh, okay. Well, lucky RCA. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
<clears throat> so you sort of poke fun at various industries early on, and now again, I think you're, you've, you've reached the point in your career where you're actually you're being finding some appreciation among those industries that that you're uh, uh, I won't say derided, but you definitely were scratching at them, poking at them. How does that feel? What does that mean for you as you go forward? making art that is now, finally, um, more acceptable, more palatable to those people, to those audiences? Well, you know, I, I, I don't know that it's necessarily more or, or less, you know, palatable, you know, right? And, and, and even in the beginning when I was, you know, kind of making fun of celebrity and mocking celebrity, like, it was also with a kind of reverence um, for the culture. Uh, one of the things I used to always say um, uh, is that I feel like uh, um, Chuck D did a, a great disservice when he said uh, CNN, I mean, hip hop was the CNN of the hood. Uh, because at, at that point, anything that any rapper said, people took like verbatim. And, and I always found that to be quite ridiculous. You know, like when I uh, um, uh, first started my career as a graphic designer, I used to work, you know, like this with, you know, big hip hop artists designing their collateral and stuff. And that's actually what kind of informed the whole, like, for humble papers, the shit thing to begin with. It was like, you know, I got to see, you know, uh, Sean Combs versus P. Diddy, you know, uh, or, you know, Buster Rhymes. Like, I got to know who the person was and see that they were very different from these, like, sure. personalities that they played on TV. Sure. Um, and so the whole for humble papers, the shit thing was kind of, like, created off of that. Like, what would happen if somebody marketed or, you know, created... Uh, 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 created a platform of marketing for a visual artist the same way we did a rap artist. Like, would it have the same impact? Um, and that's how the whole thing started. But, uh, you know, like, me mocking uh, celebrity culture, uh, especially at that time, this is like, you know, in the early 2000s when, like, reality TV first hit and, you know, you have Paris Hilton <laughs> and you know, all those people. I mean, it was like, it was completely insane, you know, uh, you know, the ways in which uh, there was this sort of uh, uh, idolization of, of celebrities. I mean, all you had to do was be on TV. You didn't have to even really open your mouth, you know what I mean? And I, and I just found that to be hilarious. And in fact, uh, you may mention before about the entourages and stuff like that. And those, those were performance art pieces, sure. you know. Um, where, you know, I would show up at a gallery with a big entourage of people, and, 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 and I always called them anti-performances, because I didn't do anything, mm -hmm. you know? I didn't act any differently. I, you know, in fact, half the time I didn't even speak, you know? Uh, well, but that's part of the effect, though. Right, but people would see you were the untouchable. entourage. Right. Yeah, people <laughs> would see the entourage, they would see the bodyguard, and they would begin to act towards me in a certain, you know, they would shy away in the corner, and, you know, is it okay if I get a pic? You know, like, oh, you know, just take a picture. You know what I mean? It's like, and so that, that kind of stuff was like really interesting to me. And so, uh, you know, I, I was, you know, using uh, my platform um, as an artist and, you know, through the, through the paintings and through those performances, again, to kind of get into these, these ideas and, and undo them from the inside out. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't so much about, you know, mocking, you know, or, or, uh, aspiring to be on covers of magazines as much as it was, you know, like what are we really saying about these people who are on the covers of magazines? Right. So it was, a, it was critiquing. Yeah, right? yeah. In a sense. And it, I think in, in a lot of ways you were, in that critique, you were ahead of your time and your work. And, and, I, and I say that because I, I think that moment, the, the, the Paris Hilton moment, we don't hear so much about her in particular right. anymore, but, but again, things have exploded. And you know, ten years later, we're in the we're in the era of the avatar, right? Like, you know, you you through technology, average individuals can go on screen and literally reinvent themselves every day. Like, you know, look at my bio, change your bio, change your change your profile picture, change these things. I mean, you can lie, but then that lie may become the, the reality mm -hmm. at some point. And I mean, I think I think we are all becoming. Uh, adept at inventing our own celebrity on a, on a certain level, and, and more and more we see people who are famous for being famous, right? Um, we watch them on TV living what are apparently their everyday lives, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I really trip about, you know, people in the entertainment industry who would get caught up in their own, their own idea. Right. 
like 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 rappers who would get in more uh, criminal altercations, in more trouble right. after they became famous than because, they ever did before they because became of, because of what they have said like publicly about you know who they were. Well, because of what they said, and because of maybe in some cases they're trying to live their own right. That's what I mean. Yeah, live their own right. fantasy right, right. And, and feel the need to yeah. do that because at the, at the time there was this idea that they were one and the same. Um, in literary studies, uh, one of the things I emphasize, in literary studies and in hip-hop studies, I emphasize the distinction between the speaker and the author, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the author of the book is not necessarily the speaker or narrator, right? Um, Ralph Ellison didn't even name his narrator. Um, so I'm asking, in that, with that in mind, is that you in the painting? Yeah, you know, it's, is this is yeah. this is this autobiography or are you simply your own sitter, your own model? Yeah, and I'll, <laughs> I'll, I've always maintained that you know, even though it's my body, it's not me. You know, uh, similar to you did use the word autobi autobiographical earlier. Well, autobiographical <laughs> in the sense of uh, you know the the sort of arc of the work. Mm -hmm. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it has to be to some degree autobiographical because I'm I'm. You know, I'm I'm asking the questions. Right. You know, I'm right. I'm asking the questions, but this character gets to you know perform it out for me. You know, it's like a um, like like a a, a a puppet. You know, that I created. You know, I I, I want to see what will happen if, and so I put the puppet out there to you know to do the dance, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the, the the for as much as you know, I I am uh, in 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 my own work. It's not about me mm -hmm. as much as it is about the ideas that I'm uh, attempting to address. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and there are certain things that I try to do to maintain a degree of separation between myself and, you know, the character, and, you know, even in terms of renderings. Like, I, I, I never put my tattoos on my body in my paintings, you know what I'm saying? Uh, or, uh, you know, with the exception of my Aleke, I never, you know, reveal any of my jewelry for you know, over 90% of the work, you don't even see my eyes, mm -hmm. you, know? Um, you know. So this is very deliberate. Yeah, very deliberate, yeah. Uh, um, and so, and that's why I say, like, it's almost like the end is the beginning now because now I'm in a place where, you know, you, you do see my eyes in the work, you know what I mean? You do see, you know, still very much, uh, you know, an ex exploration of this notion of, of remembering the black body, but, you know, in, in remembering that black body, like, it's, in the coming together, I'm now, you know, like sort of emerging in it as well. Okay, so so the the, the character on canvas is not necessarily you. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if it's if it's if it's the same character over time. And I'm thinking about um, again, <coughs> again, some 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 people make art and they get caught up in their particular design, right? Uh, so much so that, for instance, um, Eminem puts out a record, raps in a certain way for a number of years, and then Marshall Mathers decides that he actually wants to do things a little bit differently, but he feels so connected or so tied to the Eminem character on record that he has to invent another character and say, okay, well, this is Slim Shady. And then... A little while later, he says, well, there's something else I want to talk about, you know, that Slim Shady wouldn't talk about and that Eminem wouldn't talk about, so this is the Marshall Mathers album, right? Beyonce did a similar thing with Sasha Fierce. Mm -hmm. uh, are we seeing the development of the same character over the course of your work, or are these different characters in, say, the, 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 the Yoruba spiritual attire versus the baggy jeans and boxer shorts. Yeah, no, it's the same character. Same, same, the same character. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, which is which is really actually kind of been interesting to see. Um, you so know, this character is growing and it's, yeah, 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 right. Like uh, um, this this past fall, I uh, had a retrospective exhibition um, in Paris, France, mm -hmm. uh, and it was a, a collection of over forty works from collections in Europe. Some I hadn't seen since I painted them in two thousand six. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time um, that I'd ever seen that much of my work in one place at the same time. You know, I'm talking 2006 up to 2016, all in one, you know, space together. And to be able to walk through that 
and see the character actually evolve. And yeah, this boy has come a long way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And then, you know, a, a, a few weeks later to open a, an exhibition of completely new work, you know, uh, you know a, a, a few miles away mm -hmm. um, in the gallery, uh, and, and to put all of that, you know, in the, in, in the, in the uh, sort of a, uh, like in, in, the, in the palm of my hands where I can look at it and kind of take stock. You know, uh, you know, you can. I, I could see the kind of uh, evolution, you know, of the character over time, and maybe even the. See, maybe even begin to see myself emerging inside of the character as well. Is character fair? I, I, I might have said figure. I mean, character. As you talk uh, about yeah. it, character feels diminutive in some way. But, well, no, no, because uh, it's uh, certainly a character. You know uh, what I mean? Like, I, I see, you know, like, for Hamel Pekus, the shit is, uh, like you said, it's like an avatar. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know I, can, I can dress him up in right. any kind of way to, you know, to, to, to speak to whatever, you know, uh, thematics I'm dealing with in a, in a particular body of work. Um, and so, yeah, he's, he's, he's a character. You know, he's, I can, you know, like, like almost like a... a I don't want to say a doll, but you know what I mean, like something that I can, you know, mold and you know, kind of position, uh, you know, the way that I I need for a particular to answer a particular question for me. So, so in your process, and, and here and here we 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 start to hint at at things that maybe maybe circular certain returns. Mm -hmm. Early on, uh, we have uh, actual and and uh, manufactured art magazines and 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 our, our hero appears on their covers. Later on, almost 10 years later on, mm -hmm. more than 10 years maybe, our hero appears on the covers of magazines like Tan and Negro Digest mm -hmm. and, and those things. What's, what's, happening, what's happening for you as, 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 the, as the designer of, of this project um, in that shift? What's, what were you after? It's the, the same notion I was uh, speaking of before about um, the very unlinear movement of black blackness and black identity. Um, and so, the, in fact, the new series that I'm working on goes even further back beyond, you know, Tan and Negro Digest in these magazines and goes to the African continent to my, you know, magazines published on the African continent, you know, in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, you know. Uh, and it's this kind of movement through time, you know, as, uh, almost as a way of sampling um, and collecting bits of, uh, bits of the essence, you know, of, of blackness as a means of, you know, kind of building up, um, you know, the narrative and building up the conversation. Uh, you know, so there's this, like I said, there's this shift, uh, you know, between, you know, the now and, and what has been, you know, what can be. Uh, you know, so past, present, and future converge, um, you know, on, on these canvases. Uh, and I'm really interested in, 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 in that idea of that convergence, right? You know, past, present, future of body, mind, and spirit, you know what I mean, as a, as a way of remembering. Mm -hmm. we're, we're remembering, but I wonder if there's something speculative happening, too, because we've got hip-hop elements, um, Yoruba elements, mm -hmm. but also um, elements that seem to speak specifically to the negritude movement, which to the extent that it overlaps some with the Harlem Renaissance or the New Negro movement um, in the States, well, it's, I mean, it's bigger than that, but to the extent that they overlap, we are coming close to a 100-year to a anniversary of, mm -hmm. that, of that time, of, mm -hmm. those, of those movements. Why, why negritude? Why that particular periodized aesthetic, yeah. <laughs> the period and, and the aesthetic of that period, I should say. Uh, well, uh, very, very particularly because the, uh, the negritude movement was one of the, maybe actually the first of uh, the kind of uh, black radical ideological movements that actually was uh, specifically invested in mining blackness uh, to discover Africanity. Um, you know, whereas, uh, you know, in the Harlem Renaissance, it was, you know, about expression of blackness. Like, what is it to be a Negro? You know what I mean? Uh, the negative movement was like, what is it to be African? Like, what, it, what you know what I mean? Like, return to my native land. You know, uh, M.A. Cesar's, you know, um, uh, 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 book of writing. Uh, and, and these notebooks of, 
and, and it was it was also more pan African and more diasporan uh, uh, in its thinking and in its reach. Uh, and I'm really I, I was really interested in in that you know over and above you know what was happening you know say in the you know like I said the Harlem Renaissance uh, uh, or even the black uh, black arts movement of the 60s, you know, um, even that movement was kind of building from what had been discovered through the negative movement, you know, and in and, and, and the negative movement's ability to connect uh, beyond the borders of like European colonies and back to the continent of Africa. Uh, so that that's really kind of why I, I really gravitate towards that because it, it's an ideological uh, expression, creative expression that searches for Africanness. Okay, well, I have a, I have a sort of a parallel inquiry that, <laughs> uh, that might, be a little, might be a little broader. Um, so so a, a lot of what I teach at, at Georgia State, I teach in the English department, but I, I'm pretty interdisciplinary myself. And I organize a lot of courses and a lot of my work around sort of a, a series of movements, social, civil resistive movements among black people, especially in the United States. So for instance, the abolitionist movement, the long abolitionist movement, uh, the civil rights black power movement, which sometimes uh, sometimes overlap, um, and sometimes they, they, diver they diverge. Uh, we talk about the new Negro movement, sometimes called the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and perhaps we can talk about hip-hop movement to the extent that that hip-hop has been <sighs> mobilized in some political fashions um, um, mobilized as a as a as a mechanism for to 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 inspire change mm -hmm. um, in some way or another um, a question I want to put a pin in is what comes next and perhaps we're seeing the beginnings of what comes next because we're, we're very much moving into <coughs> the digital mm -hmm age where well, we're here we're, we're we're very very much in it right who knows what's 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 happening tomorrow but here we are um you have stretched your work beyond the canvas um so i have a couple of questions wrapped in here but you, you stretch it into the performative often when you have a series of visual work you connect it to uh uh music mm -hmm. um some sound recordings uh obviously the the the, the performance art of of your entries and presentations that that you do maybe in different ways and I know you've done some some work with dance mm -hmm. you know um, wearing wearable you created wearable work and mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, perform with that um, I'm wondering about some justifications for for the analog right now what and, and you've had you've worked in the digital you've done graphic design and mm -hmm. all these things what is the function or the value of, of, of just messy paint on canvas right now? Why that when we're, when we're so digital? You know, uh, I, I think the more, uh, and this is a personal opinion, but um, I feel like the more attached we become to digital mediums, the more, uh, the more necessary, um, you know, things that are tactile, mm -hmm. like the plastic arts, you know, become. Um, because, you know, in, in a sense, uh, you know, the, the actual production, you know, will become more and more rarefied. Um, and so having something that you can actually, like, touch and feel you know, uh, it will, will is, is imperative. Um, you know, I, I'm, you know, like uh, all of my work starts out digitally. Um, you know, I lay it out on a computer and I'm sure I could blow those things up to the size of the paintings and put them in a gallery, but there's something to be said about. As, as photographs, you, you, right, start, as you, photographs. you start with photographs yeah. often, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's something to be said about, you know, someone took the time not only, uh, you know, to scale this image up, you know, you know, a thousand times, but they've actually painted mm -hmm. this with a brush by hand, you know, and there's a kind of a, a animation, an activation 
you know, um, almost a ritualistic, you know, expression that goes into making a painting um, that I think has a, a power and a resonance that cannot be replicated or duplicated in a digital medium. Uh, and, it, and it won't have the same, you know, the same sort of feeling, can't create the same sense of affect. Um, and I think that those kinds of things are important. Uh, you know, and, 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 and then, you know, there's this quote that I really love. Uh, it says, in the future, historians will tell what happened. Artists will tell how it felt. Right? And, you, you know, like painting for me is that painting is feeling. You know, it's like, a, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really know how to put it into words, but, you know, there's a certain way you can move a brush to convey a feeling. There's a certain way that a color, you know, in a painting can, you know, uh, can, can move you into a certain kind of mood. I don't know that that can be done in, you know, pixels. You know what I'm saying? Uh, possibly, maybe, but I, I, I don't want to be here for that part. <laughs> I mean, what do you say to the person who says uh, it doesn't matter if the DJ is spinning all vinyl? But you know, listen, I just, I, anybody, I don't even, I don't even I, see the DJ. I'm just there anybody to dance. in this, anybody in this room who has I'm ever been, dance. who's ever been in a club Why does it where, matter? wait, wait, anybody in this, <laughs> anybody in here who's ever been in a room where somebody's playing a, a digital audio file, MP3? I don't care how great the speakers are, versus someone in a room playing an actual vinyl record, you can literally feel the difference. You can literally feel the difference in the sound. You can feel it. I, I like to think so. I, no, I, 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 I'm here. I, you know, I put my hand on the Bible or whatever. I swear by it. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm on your side. <laughs> uh, okay, so we, we were re remembering the black body, and that made me think of an, another piece of literature. Um, uh, in 1987, a woman named Toni Morrison published a book called Beloved. Um, I'm basically quoting things from stuff I'm teaching right now. So <laughs> it's like, whatever. Um, I was talking about time. It's so hard for me to believe, in, to believe in it. Some things go, pass on. Some things just stay. I used to think it was my, my rememory. You know, some things you forget, other things you never do. But it's not... Places, places are still there. If a house burns down, it's gone, but the place, the picture of it, stays, and not just in my rememory, but out there in the world. What I remember is a picture floating around out there, outside my head. I mean, even if I don't think it, even if I die, the picture of what I did or knew or saw is still out there, right in the place where it happened. Um, Morrison was writing a fiction, but developing what became a pretty resonant theory at the same time. And this, it's, it's around this notion of rememory, mm -hmm. which is about connecting our consciousness to, to, to a materiality, actually. You know, going to a place where something happened, and because you're in that place, and you can touch the things in that place, and you can smell the air, a memory that may not have even been yours most immediately comes to you. Mm -hmm. um, for better or for worse. And, and when I say I'm on your side, I, I do think that we're, we're getting away from the material to a certain level and we need more things that we can touch. We're very invested in the ephemeral right now, it seems. You know, things that float away, actually some people prefer it, right? I can post this picture and it disappears in 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, if you try to capture it, I'll know to the Snapchat people, right? <laughs> you try to snap, you try to take a picture of their picture, you're like, they'll know, you know? And they may block you from then on. Um, so yes, I, I mean, I, d I do think we need to get back to touchable, mm -hmm. touchable things. And um, I think that's important, too, in a conversation about the body, especially right now when we are at a, at a, at a, at a very high pitch revisiting conversations about the relationship between the body and the state mm -hmm. and uh, how, how we are treated. Um, black and brown bodies, women's bodies. Um, and it seems to me that it's always been about bodies, uh, right? Uh, the more conservative elements of our, of our uh, nation, this nation, or maybe the world, um, are very invested in our bodies and what we do with them, where your body can go, where your body can't go. What kind of bodies are allowed? What kind of bodies are allowed or not allowed? What your body can consume, 
whether you can eat or drink or smoke, uh, who can have babies, mm -hmm. you know, make new bodies, <laughs> right, or not, um, how you do that, where your bodies live, where right. your bodies sleep, who your, what bodies your body sleeps next to, and so, so on and so forth. Think about most of our heated arguments in, 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 in the political sense right now, and most of them come down to what somebody thinks someone else can do with their, body. can do with their bodies, and obviously, you know, if we go back to enslavement of black people and now the carceral state, <laughs> we're still talking about containment, mm -hmm. restriction of bodies. So I think, I think um, your shirtlessness um, <laughs> is important, yeah. and your shirtlessness on canvas is important, yeah, yeah. in person and on canvas is important in, in, a, in a touchable space, right, to remind people of the materiality, mm -hmm. the matter. And um, how, is, how does your turn of phrase go? Um, Black matter lives? Yeah. Can you say more about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so when, when I was working on that, uh, that particular body of work, it was uh, shortly after doing the exhibition um, uh, Do or Die, um, Affect Ritual Resistance. But Black Matter Lives was really a sort of direct response to the idea of, um, how can I say this without offending anyone? Um, <laughs> Like I, I was really frustrated with the the models of resistance that were being played out, um, you know, in, in in response to the kinds of violence and, and trauma that has, you know, uh, impacted the black community. You know, this like uh, the the whole hands up, don't shoot thing, and you know, all of these kinds of things that that felt like you know uh, supplicating, you know, uh, supplicating gestures. You know, please acknowledge me, please don't kill me kind of thing, you know what I mean? Right. Uh, and, and Black Matter Lives was, rather than being a, a, a plea or request, was an assertion, um, you know, that, you know, our blackness is here and it thrives in the way that it does, not because someone, uh, you know, afforded us the abilities to, to live, but in spite of, right? Um, and so that, you know, through all of the trauma, through all of the, the violence, through all of the, the uh, you know, you, you name it, any, any number of uh, um, uh, traumatic experiences that, that the black body has endured, we're still here, mm -hmm. and we're still beautiful, and we still shine, and we still grow, we still glow, like, you know, so Black Matter Lives was, was, was really a, that assertion. So rather than saying uh, Black Lives Matter, which sounds like, you know, please acknowledge, you know, it's like Black Matter Lives, like, you better notice, you know. There is a shift, I think, in that. In, well, that, in, in that switch. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the thing. It's like you know, uh, part of, uh, uh, you know, like you said earlier, like one of the the major components of my work is also language, right? And the ways the, the ways uh, that we use language and the ways in which language has been used against us. Mm -hmm. You know, um, for example, one of the phrases that makes uh, my hair stand up on the back of my neck is when people say uh, peaceful protests. There's no such thing as a peaceful protest, you know, like a protest by its very nature is, is, is you know, dis disruptive, you know what I'm saying? And so, right. uh, you know, when, 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 when people try to uh, coax you and convince you that the best way for you to protest is to protest in a way that they feel comfortable, you know, then something's wrong with that, you know what I mean? And that's the trick of language, right? And so when you don't have a mastery of language, language can be wielded against you. Right? Uh, and so that's why, I like, you know, when, when you see in my work, I, I take words and flip them, rearrange them, undo them, re, you know, uh, reconstitute them to make them say things that, that are empowering as opposed to, to take power away. There seems to be something about, obviously, agency, but, but, but uh, really interior subjectivities in that shift in syntax, really, right? <laughs> um, Black Lives Matter does in fact seem like, I will not necessarily say a plea, but a demand that, that, that someone outside yourself right. recognize, you. recognize right. you in a certain way versus Black Matter Lives is a, is a sort of self-acknowledgement, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I see where you're, you're going there. And, one of, one of, and it reminds me, of course, of one of the places where our work began to intersect um, was conversations around 
Kanye West. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, told you we get to Kanye West. <laughs> but um, I already told you who I thought I was, right? Right, right. A God, mm -hmm. right? And some of you may be familiar with his, with his interview in which he called himself a God and the year-long backlash, um, you know, that he sustained. Mm -hmm. um, people weren't really happy with that. And it, but it seems that he wasn't asking anyone else to call him a God. Right. He was saying, I, I already am. This is what I think of myself. Um, yeah. Before uh, this project came to book form, or, or maybe maybe the notion, of, and maybe you could say a few words about how this project fits into your doctoral work. Uh, I think you were thinking about doing a dissertation project specifically about, well, centering Kanye West mm -hmm. and talking about celebrity. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, talking about resistance. Talking about resistance. Okay. Um, you put that aside. Um, why did you put that aside? And uh, maybe correct me, tell me more about the resistance part. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, my original um, uh, topic for my dissertation was, was going to be on, on uh, embedded notions of resistance in the work of Kanye West. Mm -hmm. um, and it was called, uh, We Don't Care What People Say, Obstinate Resistance in the Work of Kanye West. Uh, and what I was really interested in is, you know, uh, particularly up until that point, uh, which was about 2013 or so, um, pretty much every Kanye album, you know, dealt with resistance, mm -hmm. you know. Um, to institutions. To, yeah, to institutions, uh, but also resistance to uh, an idea of, of, of uh, unworthy, uh, unworthiness of self, right? Um, so that so many of us go around feeling like, you know, uh, we have to appease to somebody bigger than us or greater than us, which is, you know, why the whole uh, worship of celebrity was so absurd to me. You know what I mean? It's like you don't see your own value uh, because you think that person on the magazine cover has more value than you, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I was really interested in that idea uh, of Kanye West. And, and actually, uh, one of the reasons that I, I, I admire Kanye West so much is that I see a lot of parallels in, in his work and my own. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, what I, uh, the reason that I kind of landed on doing a project on Kanye West is I felt like it would allow me to talk about ideas in my own work without talking about my work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's kind of like, well, I already, you know, use my body and all my paintings and stuff like that. I don't want to spend, you know, the next five years writing about, you know, my work as well. Um, but ultimately, I realized that I could actually use my work and not write about my work as my dissertation. Uh, and so now my dissertation is actually a visual, uh, um, visual dissertation. It's an exhibition that's featured in the the book. It's called Do or Die: um, Affect, Ritual, Resistance. Um, and um, the 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 idea is still there, this idea of resistance is still there, uh, but specifically resistance to the spectacle of black death. Um, but using art as a way to have a different kind of conversation, one that uh, escapes the limits and um, uh, restrictions of uh, conventional language um, and, you know, is able to have that same sort of, um, uh, sort of tactile uh, expression that we were, you know, making reference to when we talked about listening to a record, you know what I mean? So, like, there's a way of reading a painting that can give you so much information that if I wrote down to you, if, if I wrote a description of what I painted versus you seeing the painting, we'd be having two very different conversations, right? Um, and so I wanted to uh, create a, a narrative and create a conversation using a body of work. So the paintings, the drawings, the photography, the videos, the film, everything in the, in the exhibition is a text uh, as opposed to writing about the uh, or trying to describe it through conventional means. Indeed, layerings of layerings right. of text. Uh, are you guys comfortable for a few more minutes? I think we got maybe okay. like five. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I did want to talk a little bit about about scholarship and, mm -hmm. and your your publicness. Mm -hmm. um, I think our, our our I think we're running out of steam when it comes to our notion of, of the public intellectual right now. Mm -hmm. and, and what I mean is a, is, a, is a movement among scholars working in the academy who want to be more public, who want to reach other audiences and be more broadly recognized. And one thing you have been for sure um, is, is very public. Uh, Fahamu has a, a painting on the side of the Marta stop. 
the MLK model. And then a more recent one, I, I, I saw it, but I didn't know where it was. Yeah, Ashby Station. Ashby? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think I've been to that station. <laughs> I mean, very public, tactile, right? Um, the, 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 the work that you do outside of the canvas or beyond the canvas or along with the canvas, is, is that something you see as necessary or does that just come nat natural to you that, that, okay, I've got this painting, but I want to make an EP to go with it or, you know, I've got this painting, but I want to, you know, I want to put on this, this costume and dance. Um, is that necessary now? And I, I guess I'm still sticking with the question of sort of a, a valuation question about, about the analog, about, mm -hmm. about our art now. Do, does it need, <laughs> does it need more? Mm -hmm. Um, and to the point of your, your own scholarship, I mean, I think perhaps some of what we're seeing in, in this, um, regardless of whether it's necessary or natural, is, is, a, is a different type of public intellectualism that is performative and touchable and mm -hmm. active and dynamic in, in a different way. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I would say... Um, different from a radio show alone, for right. instance, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I, I, would, I would say, um, like, if you think about it again, if you think about or as I think about my work as text, say, for example, you know, uh, this painting may be a paragraph, right? But this song on this, you know, over here may be a separate paragraph. It's not saying the same thing that the painting has said. It's saying something different, but, uh, you know, the, what needed to be said necessitated that particular medium. Um, and so as I think about my work, I don't think about it in terms of, um, you know, oh, I, I, I make paintings, so everything I do has to be a painting. You know, if the idea comes to me as, oh, this will be a dope, you know, uh, short video, then I'll, I will make it, a, make it as a short video. Mm -hmm. uh, or this works better as a painting, then I'll make this as a painting. This, this works better as a drawing, I do it as a drawing. Uh, this is an installation, I do it as an installation. So I allow the, the, uh, the medium to be dictated by the concept as opposed to trying to dictate the concept through the medium. Did you see any resistance in terms of turning your, turning the dissertation work into, you know, from, from a traditional dissertation into something more mm -hmm. uh, interactive? <laughs> no, nah, in fact, uh, everybody on my committee was like, uh, we were waiting on you to say that, you know. Uh, so it was actually, it's been very, very well received and, you know, everyone is very excited about the ideas as far as I know and been able to research it's the first ever visual dissertation. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, it could set a precedent for other projects like it. Thank you. Uh, but I, I will say, you know, uh, it's not the first uh, uh, non-traditional non dissertation. In fact, um, in 2016, a, a, a student graduated from Clemson University. His dissertation is a hip-hop album. Um, there was someone in uh, 2014 who did a dissertation at, in the form of a graphic novel. Um, so there's, you know, precedent for, you know, unconventional forms of dissertations, mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I don't know that anyone has done one as a, a, a exhibition. Uh, um, glad you're doing it too. I'm, I'm having more uh, graduate students, emerging scholars, come with ideas mm -hmm. of, of, about getting off the page, right. or at least off the page alone. Um, so hopefully, what you're doing will <laughs> serve as precedent. You know, something we can point to, touch. Yeah. Well, I will say this too about the exhibition. Um, you know, lock it in, stay tuned. The the exhibition is actually touring now through 2020. Uh, it comes here to the Carlos Museum at Emory uh, in January of 2019. So keep it on your radar. Stop here. Let's do it. Thank you guys for thank you so much your attention. Thanks, Scott. Um, and uh, I, I hope that was informative and. Guys, that you guys enjoyed it. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have in, out in the lobby. And uh, if you haven't gotten a book already, they, we do have more for sale. It's a very beautiful book. And I'm happy to sign them. And for those of you who have already purchased one, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you guys for coming out. Thanks for your support. Thanks.